Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. There will be a book signing um, of this fantastic book at the end of this session, uh, which will incorporate not only two fantastic storytellers, but the children's laureate Chris Riddell, who will be live drawing during this session. And you'll be able to see up on the screen some of the images that he'll create that will follow not only the conversation on stage, but also you, the audience. These are stories from across the world which have travelled across time and space because they're absolutely true. To talk about them, we have two of our favourite and best-loved Hay Festival guests. Please give a very warm welcome to Chris Riddell, to Stephen Fry and to Neil Gaiman. What a welcome. Isn't that nice. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> oh. Golly. Well, Neil, how wonderful it is to sit with you. I, I have to tell you, you don't know this, I haven't told you this yet, but I I almost had my bowels fall out about, um, <laughs> about uh, eight months ago. I was in the middle of writing a book, which uh, is going to come out in November, and it's a retelling of the Greek myths. And uh, I heard from someone excitedly saying, who didn't know I was doing this, oh, have you heard? Neil Gaiman's got this book of Norse myths coming out. And rather than thinking, hooray, a new Neil Gaiman, which is, of course, what I would normally think, I thought, oh, sod, is he doing a series? <laughs> Oh, no. And I, lit, I called up my agent. I said, oh, God, please, can you find out if Neil Gaiman is planning to do the then Greek and other myths? Because if he is, I'm going to stick a rusty knife in my guts and end it all. But <laughs> fortunately, you apparently have no plans to expand in Europe, as it were, as <laughs> Hitler would have put it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, I, I've, I've read your book. You obviously haven't read mine because it's not out yet. It is just miraculous. Can you just... Start by, by telling somebody about the genesis of it, why you chose Norse myths. Have you always been uh, um, addicted to them, as it were? I, I've always been addicted um, to Norse myths. I discovered Norse myths age seven, maybe six. Yeah. Um, in, originally, in, just in the reprints of The Adventures of the Mighty Thor in an English comic called Fantastic, oh. um, which was just these black and white reprints. And I just remember... A crippled Dr. Don Blake with his stick in the back of a cave. That was their description, not mine. Um, and he's trapped in this cave by aliens, as you would be. But he, and his own stick has been broken, but he finds a stick and he bangs it against the rock. And it transforms into Mjolnir, the, the hammer of the Thor, hammer and he becomes Thor. And I spent the rest of my childhood finding sticks and just going... <laughs> Because you can never be too sure. You can't. Um, and from there, it was Roger Lancelin Green. Oh, my goodness, already? Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> Heavens, he's so, quick, isn't he? <laughs> oh, my word. So... <laughs> so... So, Roger Lancelin Green oh, did his I, Myths yeah. of the Norsemen, oh, and... And I went to them driven by the comics because I thought, okay, well, the, the, I the want comic, to learn more Asgard about is, is a, is a, Asgard is a, is a planet or something it's, in the Marvel world, It's a glorious... It? Well, back then, it was a sort of science fictional world. It was yeah. very science fiction-y. Um, I just wanted to know more about yeah. what, where this stuff came from. And what I discovered was something else entirely. Um, the Roger Lanson and Green retellings you're up somewhere in the frozen north and, and, and there are giants and Loki is not this evil god of mischief. He's much more complicated and Thor is not this mighty, good-looking, blondie superhero. <laughs> He's a little bit more dim and <laughs> big. And, and yeah. Odin is not this sort of glorious father figure. He seems to have a mysterious weaknesses. agenda, yeah. uh, weaknesses and, and yeah. some kind of weird agenda. So I, I, I loved that. Um, and that was really where it began for me. Uh, but where the book began was, was 
um, 2008. I even know the date, which I never do normally. It was November the 10th, 2008. It was my birthday. It was lunchtime. And um, a lovely American editor at Norton's from um, had lunch with me and just said, have you ever thought about, I know you, you love the Norse myths. They crop up in Sandman. They crop up in, in American, American Gods. Gods. Of course, yeah. um, you did that Odd and the Frost Giants book where you sort of do them for, for kids that Chris so gloriously illustrated. Um, although Chris's illustrations wouldn't be for like eight years in the future and <laughs> Amy could not see the future. I, that was an interpolation by me. All right. <laughs> um, just got making that, sure that was clear. So, but Amy, Amy said, would you do this? And I, it took me several years of thinking about it, trying to figure out the voice that I would tell them yeah. in. The voice was... It was like the retelling was easy. The voice it was hard. It is a hard. tricky bit, isn't it? As to whether... You, what's wonderful is I, I know if I were a child, I would adore this book. It's not, it's not adult. But on the other hand, it doesn't talk down at all. And the other thing which I, I've, I found so important in trying to write them is not trying to explain them. Just tell the story. Don't say... Even if it's obvious. I mean, the Greek myths, for example, one of the great stories that Ovid tells is... Um, he calls it Cupid and Psyche, and we yeah. think of Eros and Psyche. And it's so obvious to think of that as an allegory. You know, there's the soul, Psyche, and there's physical love, Eros, and they get together. And that's the Greeks surely telling us about how true love must be a mixture of body and soul. But actually, it's much better if you just tell it as a story and let the reader think that. And I found that with yours. You don't ever belabor a story and make it about Vikings or about history. But it's... If, if you try and explain them, they get less. Yeah. They don't get more. That's exactly um, right. If you try and... It's like the more you add in... Yeah the less they become. They, 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 yeah. um, so you, you have to figure out a way to tell them. For me, it was incredibly important to write in a voice that children could cope with. Yeah. Um, it also became important to watch the stories kind of tell themselves. An example of that is there's one uh, story in the Edda, which is known to us as Loki's flighting. And it's basically Loki insulting everybody he's having dinner with, <laughs> one by one. And he's sort of saying, you did this appalling thing. And they are appalling. Um, and then the person insulted, so the next person along would say, well, yes, but I haven't done that. And he'd say, no, but you did this. And they're just going backwards and forwards. And I was looking forward to doing, that. doing the whole yeah. of Loki's fighting, the whole of the book. And I got to the point where it was, and I went, oh, hang on, if I stop here and do four pages of, you know, of, of, of Freya, they found you in bed with your brother, and when they stared at you, you farted at them. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I believe it's called, in America, it's called it throwing shade, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, doing the dozens. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> when I got to that point, it was like, oh, I actually can't do this. It, it, it... Hello. Oh, it's cute. Um, <laughs> it, it's like it doesn't actually work dramatically no. in telling that. And I just did a paragraph saying he give, insulted everybody. And, and so you give another side of Loki, which I loved. I never knew about this because uh, the, the uh, slightly apologetic but seriously unapologetic Wagnerian in me knew of Loga, mm -hmm. who is mentioned in uh, actually as a separate god in that illusory palace uh, yes. scene, uh, who's the god of fire. As, but in Wagner, Loki and Loga become one, don't they? Uh, but you have. Do tell the story of how, in order to entertain the feast, he tortures himself, essentially. So it shows he has a good side. Well, he what doesn't, a way of he, doing it, too. He doesn't really have a good side. He just never has any... any uh, the great thing about Loki... He saves himself by torturing Loki himself. Loki is the most interesting character in Norse mythology, at least for me, um, because over and over again, he gets everybody into trouble by being the smartest person in the room, but not as clever as he thinks he is. <laughs> yeah. And then, once they're in trouble, <laughs> he is the person... Oh, wow! <laughs> he is the person who the gods say, you got us into this, yeah. and you now have to get us out of it. Um, and there is one, one point where he has to make um, a goddess... Smile. Uh, she's a giantess. She's come to 
uh, for reasons all of which having to do with Loki. Um, she has uh, lost her father, and he's been murdered by the yeah. gods. And they come, and she comes, and they, they negotiate. The fascinating thing about Norse cultures is every life had value. It's vaguely assumed that people are probably going to get murdered, and it's also yeah. assumed that if you murder somebody, they come to you and you give them a bag of gold and a goat or whatever, because that's what happens yeah. when you murder somebody. Um, so she negotiates that having lost her father, uh, the gods are going to give her a husband, yeah. and they're going to make sure her, um, her father is never forgotten, and they're going to make her laugh again, because she has not smiled or laughed. Right. So they, they find her a husband, and at one point they actually take her dead father's eyes and throw them up into the sky where they shine like stars yeah. for the rest of time. But for making her laugh, um, and I, again, this is something that tells you, you a lot it about... You as well. well. You can try it at home. It tells you a lot about what the Norse found funny. <laughs> and I'm interested to find out whether or not... Chris is going to draw this. Exactly. Um, but what happens is um, Loki, who knows that he has to make her laugh or he will lose his life, uh, goes and gets a goat, ties one end of the rope to this billy goat's beard, and the other end he ties to his private bits. Um, and then goes out and engages in a game of tug of war yeah. with the goat. Um, so you imagine this feasting hall where he's just entertaining everybody and the goat is going backwards and pulling, yanking The goat is, yanking, going, is yanking and he is yanking and there is an awful lot of screaming and finally the rope breaks. Loki, screaming and clutching his nether regions, tumbles through the air and Scotty laughs. Yeah, that's so, good. Yes. Uh, and now you know everything you ever wanted to know about... <laughs> the Viking. Well, it, is, it is the weird and wonderful thing, though, about the Vikings, and I don't know if you found this writing about the Greeks. Um, Hello. No, oh, she's smiling. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> With the goat. Perfect. She's Damn, he's quick, isn't he? Quick. And we never told him that story backstage. He just. <laughs> One of the things about the the Norse that you realise that makes them very different. There are a couple of things that make the myths very different to the Greek myths. Yeah. Um, one of which is the inhospitability of the world they're in. Yes, exactly. It's... Nobody is f hanging around, not wearing very much, staring at their reflection in pools. <laughs> um, Don't you say a word against narcissists. I, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, I, and, and nor, nor is anybody sort of flitting through woodland dells in <laughs> no. pursuit of anybody. I, <laughs> It's all much more... Why don't you tell that fabulous story? You've got it here of... of well, I won't say what of. You can, you've got of a course. bit to read. I think it's just so wonderful, and everyone's going to love this. Ah, can I have a little light over here? Ooh. So this is from a longer story about the children of Loki. Loki had three children, and... Uh, that the gods had to go off into giant land and bring back. And this is about the third of Loki's children. When they had brought the third and smallest of Loki's children back from the land of the giants, it had been puppy-sized. And Tyr had scratched its neck and its head and played with it, removing its willow muzzle first. It was a wolf cub, grey and black with eyes the colour of dark amber. The wolf cub ate its meat raw, but it spoke as a man would speak in the language of men and the gods, and it was proud. The little beast was called Fenrir. It, too, was growing fast. One day it was the size of a wolf, the next the size of a cave bear, and the size of a great elk. The gods were intimidated by it, all except Tyr. He still played with it and romped with it, and he alone fed the wolf its meat each day. And each day the beast ate more than the day before, and each day it grew and it became fiercer and stronger. 
Odin watched the wolf child grow with foreboding, for in his dreams the wolf had been there at the end of everything, and the last things Odin had seen in any of his dreams of the future were the topaz eyes and the sharp white teeth of Fenris Wolf. The gods had a council and resolved at that council that they would bind Fenrir. They crafted heavy chains and shackles in the forges of the gods, and they carried the shackles to Fenrir. Here, said the gods, as if suggesting a new game. You have grown so fast, Fenrir. It is time to test your strength. We have here the heaviest chains and shackles. Do you think you could break them? I think I can, said Fenris Wolf. Bind me. The gods wrapped the huge chains around Fenrir and shackled his paws. He waited motionless while they did this. The gods smiled at each other as they chained the enormous wolf. Now, shouted Thor. Fenrir strained and stretched the muscles of his legs and the chains snapped like dry twigs. The great wolf howled to the moon, a howl of triumph and joy. I broke your chains, he said. Do not forget this. We will not forget, said the gods. The next day, Tyr went to take the wolf his meat. I broke the fetters, said Fenrir. I broke them easily. You did, said Tyr. Do you think they will test me again? I grow, and I grow stronger with every day. They will test you again. I would wager, wager my right hand on it, said Tyr. The wolf was still growing, and the gods were in the smithies, forging a new set of chains. Each link in the chains was too heavy for a normal man to lift. The metal of the chains was the strongest metal that the gods could find, iron from the earth mixed with iron that had fallen from the sky. They called these chains Dromi. The gods hauled the chains to where Fenrir slept. The wolf opened his eyes. Again, he said. If you can escape from these chains, said the gods, then your renown and your strength will be known to all the worlds. Glory will be yours. If chains like this cannot hold you, then your strength will be greater than that of any of the gods or the giants. Fenrir nodded at this and looked at the chains called Dromi, bigger than any chains had ever been, stronger than the strongest of bands. There is no glory without danger, said the wolf after some moments. I believe I can break these bindings. Chain me up. They chained him. The great wolf stretched and strained, but the chains held. The gods looked at each other. And there was the beginning of triumph in their eyes, but now the huge wolf began to twist and to writhe, to kick out his legs and strain in every muscle and every sinew. His eyes flashed and his teeth flashed and his jaws foamed. He growled as he writhed. He struggled with all his might. The gods moved back involuntarily, and it was good that they did so, for the chains fractured and then broke with such violence that the pieces were thrown far into the air. And for years to come, the gods would find lumps of shattered shackles embedded in the sides of huge trees or the side of a mountain. Yes, shouted Fenrir, and howled in his victory like a wolf and like a man. The gods who had watched the struggle did not seem, the wolf observed, to delight in his victory. Not even Tyr. Fenrir, Loki's child, brooded on this and on other matters. And Fenris' wolf grew huger and hungrier with each day that passed. Odin brooded and he pondered and he thought all the wisdom of Mimir's world was his and the wisdom he had gained from hanging from the world tree a sacrifice to himself. At last he called the light elf Skirnir, Frey's messenger, to his side and he described the chain called Glepnir. Skirnir rode his horse across the rainbow bridge to Svartalfheim with instructions to the dwarfs for how to create a chain unlike anything ever made before. The dwarfs listened to Skirnir describe their commission, and they shivered, and they named their price. 
Skirnir agreed, as he had been instructed to do by Odin, although the dwarf's price was high. The dwarfs gathered the ingredients they would need to make Glepnir. These were the six things the dwarves gathered. For firstly, the footsteps of a cat. For secondly, the beard of a woman. For thirdly, the roots of a mountain. For fourthly, the sinews of a bear. For fifthly, the breath of a fish. For sixth and lastly, the spittle of a bird. Each of these things was used to make Gleipnir. You say you have not seen these things? Of course you have not. The dwarfs used them in their crafting. When the dwarfs had finished their crafting, they gave Skernir a wooden box. Inside the box was something that looked like a long silken ribbon, smooth and soft to the touch. It was almost transparent and weighed next to nothing. Skernir rode back to Asgard with his box at his side. He arrived late in the evening after the sun had set. He showed the gods what he brought back from the workshop of the dwarfs, and they were amazed to see it. The gods went together to the shores of the Black Lake, and they called Fenrir by name. He came at a run, as a dog will come when it is called, and the gods marveled to see how big he was and how powerful. What's happening? asked the wolf. We have obtained the strongest bond of all, they told him. Not even you will be able to break it. The wolf puffed himself up. I can burst any chains, he told them proudly. Odin opened his hand to display Gleipnir. It shimmered in the moonlight. That, said the wolf, that is nothing. The gods pulled on it to show him how strong it was. We cannot break it, they told him. The wolf squinted at the silken band that they held between them, glimmering like a snail's trail or the moonlight on the waves. And he turned away, uninterested. No, he said. Bring me real chains, real fetters, heavy ones, huge ones, and let me show my strength. This is Gleipnir, said Odin. It is stronger than any chains or fetters. Are you scared, Fenrir? Scared? Not at all. But what happens if I break a thin ribbon like that? Do you think I will get renown and fame? that people will gather together and say, do you know how strong and powerful Fenris Wolf is? He is so powerful, he broke a silken ribbon. <laughs> there will be no glory for me in breaking Gleipnir. You're scared, said Odin. The great beast sniffed the air. I scent treachery and trickery said the wolf, his amber eyes flashing in the moonlight. And although I think your Gleipnir may only be a ribbon, I will not consent to be tied up by it. You, you who broke the strongest, biggest chains there ever were, you're scared by this band, said Thor. I am scared of nothing, growled the wolf. I think it is rather that you little creatures are scared of me. Odin scratched his bearded chin. You're not stupid, Fenrir. There is no treachery here, but I understand your reluctance. It would take a brave warrior to consent to be tied up with bonds he could not break. I assure you, as the father of the gods, that if you cannot break a band like this, a veritable silken ribbon, as you say, then we gods will have no reason to be afraid of you, and we will set you free and let you go your own way. A long growl from the wolf. Ah, you lie, old oh father. You lie in the way that some folk breathe. If you were to tie me up in bonds I could not escape from, then I do not believe you would free me. I think you would leave me here. I think you plan to abandon me and to betray me. I do not consent to have that ribbon placed on me. Fine words and brave words, said Odin. Words to cover your fear at being proved a coward, Fenris Wolf. You're afraid to be tied with a silken ribbon. No need for more explanations. The wolf's tongue lolled from his mouth, and he laughed then, showing sharp teeth each the size of a man's arm. Rather than question my courage, I challenge you to prove there is no treachery planned. You can tie me up if one of you will place his hand in my mouth. I will gently close my teeth upon it, but I will not bite down. 
If there is no treachery afoot, I will open my mouth when I have escaped the ribbon, or when you have freed me and his hand will be unharmed. There, I swear, if I have a hand in my mouth, you can tie me with your ribbon. So, whose hand will it be? The gods looked at each other. Balder looked at Thor, Hemdal looked at Odin, Honir looked at Frey, but none of them made a move. Then Tyr, Odin's son, sighed and stepped forward and raised his right hand. I will put my hand in your mouth, Fenrir, said Tyr. Fenrir lay on his side and Tyr put his right hand into Fenrir's mouth, just as he had done when Fenrir was a puppy and they had played together. Fenrir closed his teeth gently until they held Tyr's hand at the wrist without breaking the skin, and he closed his eyes. The gods bound him with Glepnir. A shimmering snail's trail wrapped the enormous wolf, tying his legs, rendering him immobile. There, said Odin. Now, Fenris wolf, break your bonds. Show us all how powerful you are. The wolf stretched and struggled. It pushed and strained every nerve and muscle to snap the ribbon that bound it. But with every struggle, the task seemed harder, and with every strain, the glimmering ribbon became stronger. At first, the gods sniggered. Then the gods chuckled. Finally, when they were certain that the beast had been immobilized and that they were in no danger, the gods laughed. Only Tyr was silent. He did not laugh. He could feel the sharpness of Fenris Wolf's teeth against his wrist, the wetness and warmth of Fenris Wolf's tongue against his palm and his fingers. Fenris stopped struggling. He lay there unmoving. If the gods were going to free him, they would do it now. But the gods only laughed the harder. Thor's booming guffaws, each louder than a thunderclap, mingled with Odin's dry laughter, with Baldur's bell-like laughter. Fenrir looked at Tyr. Tyr looked at him bravely. Then Tyr closed his eyes and nodded. Do it, he whispered. Fenrir bit down on Tyr's wrist. Tyr made no sound. He simply wrapped his left hand around the stump of his right and squeezed it as hard as he could to slow the spurt of blood to an ooze. Fenrir watched the gods take one end of Glepnir and thread it through a stone as big as a mountain and fasten it under the ground. Then he watched as they took another rock and used it to hammer the stone deeper into the ground than the deepest ocean. Treacherous Odin! called the wolf. If you had not lied to me, I would have been a friend to the gods. But your fear has betrayed you. I will kill you, father of the gods. I will wait until the end of all things, and I will eat the sun, and I will eat the moon. But I will take the most pleasure in killing you. The gods were careful not to get within reach of Fenrir's jaws. But as they were driving the rock deeper, Fenrir twisted and snapped at them. The god nearest him, with presence of mind, thrust his sword into the roof of Fenris' wolf's mouth. The hilt of the sword jammed in the wolf's lower jaw, wedging the jaw open and preventing it from ever closing. The wolf growled inarticulately, and saliva poured from its mouth, forming a river. If you did not know it was a wolf, you might have thought it a small mountain with a river flowing from a cave mouth. The gods left that place where the river of saliva flowed down into the dark lake and they did not speak. But once they were far enough away, they laughed some more and clapped each other on the back and smiled the huge smiles of those who believe they have done something very clever indeed. Tyr did not smile and he did not laugh. He bound the stump of his wrist tightly with a cloth and he walked beside the gods back to Asgard and he kept his own counsel. These, then, were the children of Loki. Mm. That's a great story. Fantastic. Thank you so much.
Well, we better turn to Greece for a quick while. Yes. Um, yeah, I like you. I, I grew up on, on, as you grew up on Norse myths, I grew up on Greek myths, and Robert Graves in particular was a constant companion, and uh, I just felt somehow that I'd known these stories almost before I read them. You know, they mm -hmm. had that, they, they worked inside me. And obviously, there's a, there's a more, I don't know, there's a different sort of timeline in, in Greek myth. There's a beginning, which is, you know, Hesiod the, yep. uh, in his uh, um, Theogony writes about chaos being the first thing. It's very like the Big Bang, really. It's like modern physics. There's this emptiness, chaos, doesn't quite mean what we think it means today and where we use chaos. It means a sort of abyss, a yawning gap, a nothingness, and then dark, and then everything just some, somehow appeared. And, um, and, and Well, of course, the Norse would have, would have mocked you for the, something, everything would have just appeared because as the Norse knew everything was licked into being by an enormous cow. Yes, I know. I like that. Um, That's an unusual... They would, have, they would have known that you, how unscientific <laughs> those Greeks were. They left the cow out. I I love that. It's so extraordinary. It seems so random. A cow licked, he did lick the ice and out yes. came all kinds of creatures. Um, uh, th I mean, it's, uh, there's, so many, um, there's so many remarkable similarities in, in some respects between Norse and Greek mythology. There are kind of, uh, s there are similarities of some, uh, you know, s some types of myth. Um, but the, the Greeks, like the, the Norse, I think, didn't trust the gods. That's what's so pleasing about the stories, is that the gods are treacherous. The gods betray. The gods are not to be relied upon. Um, and they are as wicked, as capricious, as lustful as humans. And, and in that sense, it's very different from a, uh, the, the myths that they grew out of. You know? And they're very, very human. They look very human. But the story I'm going to read is one that may be familiar um, to people, uh, but I'm going to read the second part of it. It's the story of Midas, the king of Phrygia, um, and you probably know about uh, Midas and his golden touch. He did a favor uh, to an old man who appeared in his rose garden. He loved roses more than anything in the world, Midas. He was rather a nice king, um, and uh, th this old man turned out to be Silenus, who was a friend, uh, the great friend and companion of Dionysus. And um, so Dionysus offered him a, a wish. Uh, and as you probably know, he chose that everything he touched turned to gold. That all went very badly, as I'm sure you know. He turned his roses to gold, and then he turned his wife and his daughter to gold, and then the food and the wine turned to gold, and he couldn't drink and he couldn't eat. And eventually Dionysus took uh, pity on him, and, uh, and, and he was able to wash in a river, and, and he was rid of the curse that he had thought was a gift. But you may be less familiar, some of you, with what happened to Midas after, after this. And it's an interesting story, I think. Um, it's going to be particularly interesting if I find it, because um, obviously I'm not... Here we go. Yeah, come on. There you go. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, oh, dear God. Sorry. <laughs> That's it. There we are. Thank you. Um, so... Um, here we are. Beg your pardon. It's, it, this is a problem with not having a book printed yet. Um, thank you. All right. You would think that Midas had learned his lesson by now, the lesson that repeats and repeats throughout the story of man. Don't mess with the gods. Don't trust the gods. Don't anger the gods. Don't barter with the gods. Don't compete with the gods. Leave the gods well alone. Treat all blessings as a curse and all promises as a trap. Above all, never insult a god, ever. In one respect, Midas had certainly changed. He now spurned not just gold, but all riches and possessions. Shortly after Dionysus lifted the curse, he became a devoted follower of Pan, the goat-footed god of nature, fawns, meadows, and all the wild things of the world. With flowers in his hair, sandals on his feet, and the merest suggestion of clothing, Covering his modesty, Midas left his wife and daughter in charge of Phrygia and devoted himself to a hippie, happy life of simple bucolic virtue. All might have been well had not his master Pan taken it into his head to challenge Apollo to a competition to determine which was the superior, the lyre or the pipes. In a meadow one afternoon before an audience of fauns, satyrs, dryads, nymphs, assorted demigods, and other lesser immortals, Pan put the syrinx to his lips. A coarse but likable air in the Lydian mode emerged. It seemed to summon barking deer, rushing waters, gambling rabbits, rutting stags, and galloping horses. The rough, 
rustic tune delighted the audience, especially Midas, who really did worship Pan and all the frolicking mirth and madness that the goatfoot represented. When Apollo stood and sounded the first notes of his lyre, a hush fell. From his strings arose visions of universal love, harmony, and happiness, a deep abiding joy in life, and a sense of heaven itself. When he had finished, the audience rose as one to applaud. Tmolus, the deity of the mountain, called out, The lyre of the great lord Apollo wins. All agreed. I, I, roared the satyrs and fauns. Apollo, Apollo, cried the nymphs and dryads. One lone voice demurred. No. No. Dozens of heads turned to see who could have dared dissent. Midas rode to his feet, rose to his feet. I disagree. I say the pipes of Pan produce the better sound. Even Pan was astonished. Apollo quietly put down his lyre and walked towards Midas. Say that again. <laughs> it could at least be said of Midas that he had the courage of his convictions. He swallowed twice before repeating, I, I say the pipes make a better sound. Their music is more exciting, more artistic. Apollo must have been in a soft mood that day, for he did not blast Midas to atoms on the spot. He did not peel the skin from him layer by layer as he had done to Marcias when that unfortunate had had the temerity to challenge him. He did not cause Midas even the slightest amount of pain, but just said softly, you honestly think Pan played better than me? I do. Well, in that case, said Apollo with a laugh, you must have the ears of an ass. <laughs> no sooner were these words out of the God's mouth then Midas felt something strange and warm and rough going on in his scalp. As he put his hands to his head to feel what was happening, howls and hoots and screams and screeches of mocking laughter started to come from the assembled throng. They could see what Midas could not. A pair of large, grey, donkey ears had pushed their way through his hair and was now twitching and flicking back and forth for all the world to see. Seems I was right, said Apollo. You do indeed have the ears of an ass. Crimsoning with shame and mortification, Midas turned and fled the meadow, the taunts and jeers of the crowd sounding all the more clearly in his great furry ears. His life as a camp follower of Pan was over. Tying his head in a kind of turban, he returned to his wife and family in the palace of Gordium, and his carefree experiment in country living decidedly over, settled back down into the life of a king. The only person who saw his ass's ears was necessarily the servant who cut his hair every month. No one else in Phrygia knew the terrible secret and Midas was determined it should stay that way. Here is the deal, Midas told the barber. I give you a bigger salary and more generous pension than any other member of the palace staff, and you keep quiet about what you have seen. If, however, you breathe a word to anyone, I slaughter your family before your eyes, cut out your tongue, and leave you to wander the world in mute poverty and exile. Understood. The frightened barber nodded. For three years, each side kept to the bargain. The barber's wife and family waxed fat and happy on the extra money that came in, and no one found out about the king's asinine auditory appendages. <laughs> Turbans in the Midas style caught on throughout Phrygia, Thrace, Lydia, and beyond. All was well, but secrets are terrible things to have to keep especially such juicy ones as that to which the royal barber was privy. Every day he would wake up and feel that the knowledge was writhing and pushing and swelling inside him. The barber loved his wife and family and was in any case loyal enough to his monarch not to have any wish to humiliate or embarrass him, but that bulging, ballooning secret had to be released somehow before he burst. No unmilked cow with swollen udders, no mother of overdue twins, no gut-stuffed gastronome straining on the privy could ever feel such a desperate need for relief from their agonies than this poor barber. Finally, 
he hit upon a scheme which he felt sure would rid him of his burden without endangering his family. Awaking from a tortured night in which he had dreamed that he revealed the secret to the gaping populace of Gordium from a balcony in the main square, he went out at first light deep into the remote countryside. In a lonely place by a stream, he dug a deep trench in the ground, looking around him in all directions to make sure that he was alone and that there was no possibility of being overheard. He knelt down, cupped his hands around his mouth and called these words into the hole. Midas has ass's ears. Scrabbling frantically to close up the hole before the words could escape, he failed to notice a tiny seed floating down and settling at the bottom. When the backfilling was done, the barber stamped fiercely up and down on the earth to seal in the dreadful secret. He skipped all the way back to Gordium, headed straight for his favorite tavern, and ordered a flagon of the house's best wine. He could drink now without fear that the wine might loosen his tongue. It was as if he had been Atlas and the sky had finally been lifted from his shoulders. Meanwhile, over the next few weeks, back in the remote field by the stream, that tiny seed, warmed by the soft breath of Gaia below, began to germinate. Soon, a delicate little reed was shouldering its way through the topsoil and pushing its delicate head into the air. As the breeze caught it, the reed softly whispered, Midas has as his ears. The faint words reached the rushes and sedges that fringed the riverbank. Midas has as his ears. The susurration of rushes and the hiss of sedges was swept on by the grasses and leaves of the trees, and swiftly the soughing and soughing of cypresses and sallows sent the sound to the breeze. King Midas has as his ears, sighed the branches. Midas has as his ears, sang the birds, and at last, the news reached the city. Midas has ass's ears. King Midas woke with a start. There was laughter and shouting in the street outside the palace. He crept to the window, crouched down and listened. The humiliation was too much for him to bear. Without stopping to wreak his vengeance on the barber and the barber's family, he mixed a poisonous draught of ox blood, raised his eyes heavenwards, gave a bitter laugh and a shrug, drained the drink, and died. Poor Midas. His name will always mean fortunate and rich, but truly he was unlucky and poor. If only he had kept to his roses. Green fingers are better than gold. Yeah, well, that's, that's the <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> Um, I'm sure you found part of the, the joy of this uh, of adventure is, is going through the, the various sources, the various poems, and in, in, in Greek case, you know, there's Apollodorus and Homer, obviously, and Ovid, and the, the, the Latin poet, and many others. And you had the Prose Edda and various other I, sagas, I, did you all? Basically, I, decide, I made a sort of choice at the beginning to go pretty much only with the Prose Edda and the Poetic Edda. Right. Um, and to go, okay, this is the stuff that we know is left over yeah. from the Viking era that was preserved into it. After, there, are, there are later sagas and later things, but yeah. um, they seem dodgier. And then once you get into sort of the Wagnerian tropes, <laughs> you're, in, yeah. you're in something else Aschenbach again. And, uh, and Eschenbach and, and uh, yeah. So it was, it, so I would occasionally, um, wander from a version that's in the Poetic Edda into the Prose Edda and back again. Mm. Um, or if, if and cherry-pick a bit, obviously. Cherry-pick yeah. cherry a bit and, and go, you know, I don't like this bit of the myth. But, um, but, you, but yeah. there wasn't the, the amount of room that you have yeah. um, in, in Greek and Roman myths of just different retellings to go, ah, I can, yeah. I can I had a lot take of this and collage. Yeah. yeah. Really, it was just, how do I tell this story pretty straight? Yes, I mean, there are, I mean a famous Greek myth, for example, one of the metamorphoses of, of, of it is, is that of Arachne, the weaver, who, who uh, you know, boasted that she could weave even better than the goddess Athena, who was the, uh, got one of her, you know, with the goddess of crafts and handicrafts, including weaving, of course. And, and, uh, 
and this little old lady comes and they have a competition and as, as everyone knows I think uh, uh, Arachne lost and was turned into a spider to weave for the rest of her life, hence arachnids, obviously. And in some versions, it's, Athena's taking pity on her and saying, you can read for that. And in other versions, it's a punishment. And it's, you sort of have to make your choice there, don't you? It's, there, there is a kind of... Um, you, you have that, and you also have the weirdness of older versions of things. So you can... Yeah. When you get into the Greeks and Romans, we actually can go excavating stories. Yes. There, there are... There are versions of Orpheus and Eurydice in which he got her back. Yes. The, uh, the uh, earliest versions, it's just a very straightforward summer and winter story of, yeah. of you go in and she winds up having to do the, 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 the sort of more Persephone-ish kind of thing of exactly. stay down there for a while. Exactly. And, then, come and back. then somewhere along the line someone went, you know, it's just a better story if he exactly. looks back and she stays there forever. I love the fact also there's a version where he's, he, he, when he dies, his head's, his head's preserved in, yes. in a cave. And people go and visit it. It just reminds me of uh, Futurama and Richard Nixon in the, you know, <laughs> sort of going to see Orpheus. But we can't, we, we've got to get the audience in. But we I should just some questions. quickly want to say well, one of the most wonderful things, some of the audience may have been able to see it, is your, your, one of your masterpieces is uh, an extraordinary book called American Gods, in which you, you quite brilliantly have, I mean, you must have hugged yourself when you had the idea um, <laughs> that... You know, all the immigrants into America and the existing population of America have their gods and had their gods according to their civilization, the culture and country they came from. So that all the Swedes and Nor Norwegians who went to Wisconsin and various other and in New York. And so you have it that those gods came with them. They do. Um, uh, and hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And anyway, just. People may know that this has just been translated in... <laughs> Damn him! <laughs> Very good. <laughs> People may know that this has been translated into a, an Amazon... Uh... It, in the UK and all around the world except for America, it's just on Amazon Prime Video. Yeah. If you go to Amazon Prime Video, I think we're five episodes in... With Ian McShane season, as, with as Mr. Wednesday. wonderful Ian McShane, <laughs> with Gillian Anderson as, yeah. as media, one of the new gods of, of media, and she gets to... Uh, portray, embody characters um, like Lucille Ball, <laughs> David Bowie and Marilyn Monroe, which is kind of, whenever she appears, yeah. she appears as a famous person. It's, um, it's um, eye-wateringly violent in places. That's but, right about that. But, uh, and hilarious and brilliant, uh, as is the book. I mean, it's a, an amazing fable, but we ought to open this up to, to our audience. I'm sure many qu questions to be uh, had, and I'm sure you want to be drawn by Chris Rindell with asses, ears, or who knows what coming out of you. Um, so, if anyone would like to show their hand, we should have people with microphones who are going to come and show that. Excellent, we've got the first one there, if you'd like. And you keep your hand up and someone else will come to you, I'm sure. Um, which of the Norse gods do you most identify with personally? Oh, um, which of the Norse gods which, do you most identify with? Yeah. Which of the gods do I most identify with? Um, they're very, very hard to identify with. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because you never, you never do that thing going, I wish I was you. Because um, we have a better life than they do, even now in this world of Brexit, Trump and madness. We have it better than them. They have full-on Ragnarok to contend with. <laughs> um, an American journalist actually said to me, have we reached peak Ragnarok yet? <laughs> I say, no, we're, we're still on the slopes. Um, <laughs> But I think if I, if I identify with anybody, um, I'm terribly fond of Kvasir, who is an almost unknown god um, who, who gets murdered by some dwarfs and uh, his, his blood is used to make the mead of poetry. And uh, then, because nobody ever gets to stay dead very long in these stories, he pops up right at the end and does some Sherlock Holmesian deduction, which was great fun to write. <laughs> um, and, and I think he's, he's the one that I'm sort of wound up most fond of because he doesn't do anything appalling <laughs> at any point, which puts him one up on pretty much everybody in the entire book. Uh, one over there. Uh, question for you, actually, Stephen. Yeah. Given um, what you've learned about Midas and the recent threat of legal trouble in Ireland, where do you stand on insulting gods these days? <laughs> 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 you <know. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
you, you, you can't, of course, insult anything you don't believe in, but it was, I, I was asked, I was asked by a journalist, uh, you know, a hypothetical question. If, if, suppose you were wrong and there was the kind of God that is presented in, you know, kind of the old fashioned way, the omnipotent, uh, uh, omniscient God, or the, um, what, would you, what would you say if you suddenly found yourself dead? And, and I obviously would have been very cross um, with that particular God. And I would have tried to call him or her to account for various of the miseries and sufferings that go on in the world for no, the unearned ones, um, and even to animals, even if you ignore what uh, humans go through in terms of you know, bone cancer in children. What, what, what kind of an idea is that? Um, but look at the animals, the, how much they, almost all animals are totally under a sense of stress and, and, and pain and die miserably. And uh, if I were God, that's not how I would make a universe, if, if, if such a God were possible. But I would make it like that if it was unwound in the way that Darwin and others suggested. <laughs> but, oh dear, I'm, I'm in trouble, yeah. <laughs> Zeus, on the other hand, I think I would definitely shake my fist at, and he would throw thunderbolts. Uh, but uh, the Greeks, too, were very angry at the gods, just as, you know, I sort of pretended to be in that interview. Um, uh, because, you know, because they punished man for the theft of fire, which is the great Prometheus myth. But, yeah, good question. So who else? Uh, there's one down at the front here. There, there, we follow the, we follow oh, the we follow hand. The, we follow the hand. There we go. No, You're yeah, back, the, that's back it, there. Because they've got the microphone. Yes. Power. That's it. Hello. Oh, Jesus. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's a whole other myth. There you are. Mr. Gaiman, um, I, there's a brief mention of Gwydion in American Gods, uh, a Welsh god. Would you ever, either of you ever consider writing Welsh mythology? Um... I think if I went back and did another volume of mythology and there are several adult novels, several children's novels and a bunch of weird little projects that I need to make first, <laughs> um, I would find myself torn between <laughs> visiting the... Um, Hello. Visiting the sort of the Assyrians and the Fertile Crescent and some of those weird things, and heading off into, into Wales and doing the Mabinochian and, and some of the old, the more sort of Celtic matter of Brittany sort of stuff. I think also, given what you've done to your spell checker by doing Norse mythology, to go straight to Welsh after that, give it a rest, you know. There, there is stuff to do, but I would love to. <laughs> oh, we're over there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, he's good. Yes, over there. Um, this is a question for all three of you, if Chris would like to jump in mm. as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can write the answer or draw it. Um, when you're writing or drawing, when you're creating and sometimes transforming and maybe even destroying, do you feel like a god yourself sometimes? <laughs> you know, I've, I've only ever felt like a god writing twice. Um, the first time was actually knowing that I was about to write a Doctor Who script and writing interior TARDIS. Oh. And I... <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> and it was like, oh, this, is, this must be what God feels like. <laughs> and the other moment was probably uh, almost 30 years before that, which was the first time I got to write Make Batman Say Something in a comic. <laughs> and the feeling of power um, was, uh, you know, it was like, yes, I, I can make Batman say oh. anything I want. So that... <laughs> I feel more like a, a, a devil than a god when I write in some ways. But there is, a, there's, you know, in a not exactly a serious way, but there is a feeling sometimes when you write that you are the kind of lord of the time and space, which is a, a marvelous feeling, the knowledge that you can change things. There's a, there was a competition with screenwriting as to who could write the shortest and most expensive stage direction, which is a kind of godlike thing when you, you know, because when you write a stage direction, you never really think about it. I remember once in a play script writing something like he, he sits at a Louis Quinze escritoire, you know, writing, you know, because I wanted a fancy desk. And, and the props person, six months later, calls me and says, we've got, 
We've got a Louis XIV escritoire or a Louis XV bureau, but we haven't got a Louis XV escritoire. <laughs> okay, oh, it doesn't matter. But anyway, the most expensive, the one that won the Hollywood Prize for the most expensive stage direction was only two words, it just, oh, well, three words. It just said, the fleets meet. <laughs> that fabulous? To be able to write that and know that that's going to be two years' work for someone, the fleets meet. Chris, have you... Oh, he's got... Oh, hello. <laughs> he's a Buddha, is he not... <laughs> Not a god. Oh. Oh, so, listen, mushroom yeah. hunters. Yeah, now listen, I uh, asked Neil if we could do this because <laughs> you may not... Uh, oh. oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Very good. We're coming... We're coming to the end now, and um, I, I asked for, as a special favour, I came across on the wonderful brainpickings.org uh, website uh, a, a, a fabulous poem that, uh, that Neil had written for his wife Amanda. It's a poem about how science began with women. It's, I won't say any more than that. Um, and Amanda's going to come on and read it. So uh, yes. there we are. I made one teeny change. Is it OK? Of course. <laughs> Hello. Um, so Neil actually uh, wrote this uh, for an occasion in New York City. Our friend Maria Popova, who runs the website Brain Pickings, did an evening of poetry about science, which was actually not boring. <laughs> it's really good. And um, I do think Neil is a fantastic writer. He's okay. <laughs> uh, and lately he's, uh, he's proven himself to be a really fantastic father, but <laughs> uh, but lately I'm actually, even though I'm proud that he's a fantastic writer and a fantastic father, uh, because the world seems to need it now more than ever, I'm really proud that he's a fantastic feminist. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks, honey. You too, Stephen. <laughs> Science, as you know, <laughs> Science, as you know, my little one, is the study of the nature and behavior of the universe. It's based on observation on experiment and measurement and the formulation of laws to describe the facts revealed. In the old times, they say, the men came already fitted with brains designed to follow flesh beasts at a run, to hurtle blindly into the unknown and then to find their way back home when lost with a slain antelope to carry between them or on bad hunting days, nothing. The women who did not need to run down prey had brains that spotted landmarks and made paths between them, left at the thorn bush and across the scree and looked down in the bowl of the half-fallen tree because sometimes there are mushrooms. Before the flint club or the flint butcher's tools, the first tool of all was a sling for the baby to keep our hands free and something to put the berries and the mushrooms in, the roots and the good leaves, the seeds and the crawlers. Then a flint pestle to smash, to crush, to grind, to break. And sometimes men chase the beasts into the deep woods and never came back. Some mushrooms will kill you while some will show you gods. And some will feed the hunger in our bellies identify.
Others will kill us if we eat them raw and kill us again if we cook them once. But if we boil them up in spring water and pour the water away and boil them once more and pour the water away, only then can we eat them safely. Observe. Observe childbirth. Measure the swell of bellies and the shapes of breasts. And through experience, discover how to bring babies safely into the world. Observe everything. And the mushroom hunters walk the ways they walk and watch the world and see what they observe. And some of them would thrive and lick their lips while others clutched their stomachs and expired. So laws are made and handed down on what is safe. Formulate. The tools we make to build our lives, our clothes, our food, our path home, all these things we base on observation, on experiment, on measurement, on truth. And science, you remember, little one, is the study of the nature and behavior of the universe based on observation, experiment, and measurement, and the formulation of laws to describe these facts. The race continues. An early scientist draws beasts upon the walls of caves to show her sister's children, now all fat on mushrooms and on berries, what would be safe to hunt. The men go on running after beasts. The scientists walk more slowly over to the brow of the hill and down to the water's edge and past the place where the red clay runs. They're carrying their babies in the slings they made, freeing their hands to pick the mushrooms. Oh, oh, thank you. And um, you. Neil and Stephen are going to be signing. It's just amazing. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you all. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Chris Riddell, come here. Oh, Chris, come on. Run away. All right. Okay. Thank you.